Poppers. What's up everybody? It's Christmas time. Time for me to recite a brand new rhyme about one of the best times of the year. <laughs> <laughs> That's my beat, beat off box. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, what are we doing? 1975. What's up, everybody? My name is Scott Waters. Welcome to the Live to Metal. We are doing the top. 20 Ish. plus yeah. of 1975. So what we've done is we've got a kind of a, a pile of ones that we like, these should be mentioned, but they're not in our list. Right. And we've got 20 that we actually put in order. Yep. 20 through one. <laughs> and I'm Trog, by the way. Oh, did I not say that? No. If you guys right. don't know who Trog is by now, I don't know. Yeah, why are you watching yeah. at all? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so without any adieu, or adieu, uh, we'll start with this one, and like we said, these first few are just in no particular order. Came out in 75 and they were good. We got Grand Funk, Double Live, Caught in the Act. A little more poppy here than they were in the earlier albums. Yep. Terry Knight was already gone there as their producer. And, yep. and you've got... I think. Was I? I think so. Yeah. And you've got a lot of hit singles. They were huge at this time. Oh and yeah. They, they were selling Massive. out stadiums Massive. two, three nights in a row. It's funny that now they're just kind of an afterthought, but they were huge back then. Yeah, and they got, I mean, you got all the stuff you'd expect to be on here. Closer to home, foot stomping music, some kind of wonderful locomotion, you know, all the hits are on here. So they were already uh, very I love well. That song. Yeah, that wonderful is a great song. Oh, awesome. But they're already very well established at this point. They were the railroad, they were four piece at this point, so they had a, uh, they had the uh, keyboard player on them with them full time. So, double live grand funk. And uh, Mark Farner actually had a hit a second time with that same yes, song. Yes, he did. He recorded it in the early 80s with his, as a solo it artist. It was, uh, 80... No, it was late. It was late. It was actually, it might have been 90 or 91. Really? That late? Yeah. Because wow. that was like part of my introduction to Christian music was that, and I was so into it. Yeah, it was a good album. Yeah. It was just a good... Anyhow. Yeah. Uriah Heep. Uriah Heep. First Wave. British Heavy Metal. Uriah Heep. Return <clears throat> to Fantasy. Great album cover. Featuring John Wetton, one of two albums that he was playing yeah. with them on. Um, Vocals and bass. Yeah, not much to say about it. It's, uh, it's a solid album. It's just not one that made our top list, either no, one of us. So. It's good stuff. Um, I like both the albums that John Wetton did with them. Yeah, I do too. It's, it's one of those albums, if if I get into a Uriah Heap mood and I start listening to all their stuff, then I, it yeah. tends to get listened to. Otherwise, if I just want to hear a Uriah Heap album, it's not the first one I go to. No, That's and Uriah Heap, really, after the first five or six, they start to get kind of spotty anyway. Yeah. So, I but still good stuff, but uh, yeah, like Scott said, not first choice. <clears throat> All right, this is going to be a twofer because they had two albums in one year. We got Iron Butterfly, Scorching Beauty, and Sun and Steel. This was pretty much their swan song. They were done after this one. Yep. Uh, it's really not even the same Iron Butterfly anymore. Uh, no, it was it was moving into a new era of music, and they were trying yep. to keep up at the time at the time so it's got it doesn't have that 60s sound like and by this one Eric Braun and Ron Bushy the drummer and the uh, guitar player respectively respectively in reverse uh, everyone else was gone they were the only two original guys left this didn't even have the second uh, mark marking of the band because Rhino wasn't there on guitar anymore Lee Dorian was our Lee uh, Lee Dorman was already gone and he had done uh, what do you call it? Captain Beyond. I don't even think he was on this one. Nope, I don't think so. Yeah, Eric and Ron are still here. Yeah, I don't see him. I thought Rhino was... No, it looks like this is this is the last... Yeah, it was the same lineup for both of these. Totally different Iron Butterfly, honestly. It's kind of straightforward rock and roll album. It's not bad, yeah. I mean... Not as proggy as they kind of were. In the Wicked Drum Solo. Again, these aren't the albums <laughs> I'm going to go for... If I'm, if I'm yeah, if you're Iron Butterfly, it's Iron Butterfly, yeah. But again, if it's if you're going in that, you get into that Iron Butterfly mood. Yep. Yeah. Definitely some cool artwork. Yeah. Looks cool. Uh, next up, this is actually. Oops. <clears throat> Just on the ground. Um, 
This is actually a, a really good album. I oh, really like awesome. This one could have been in our top 20. Yep, that's a great um, easy top. It's a great easy top album. Half live, as I believe, and half studio. Yep. Uh, you know, features the band before they became the, um, you know, kind the, of the bearded. Yeah, the massive hit makers, hit makers of, the of the 80s. Yeah. This this has the mega hit Tush on it, which everybody loved. Yep, and a lot of people have covered, that's for sure. And it's got Heard It on the X, which is one of my personal favorites. Yep, tunes. great song. And then uh, they do, uh, that, that medley's on here too, right? Yeah, there's a medley in the back. Yep. Um, like the back, do back Love Affair, Mellow Down Easy, uh, Back Love Affair number two, and Long Distance Boogie. Yep. All smashed into one nine minute jam, basically. The backdoor medley, they called it. <clears throat> but yep. Yeah, definitely a classic ZZ Top. It's a good release. album. That's really good. It really could have been in the top 20. Yeah, it could have. Which just goes right. to show you we like our top 20 a lot. Yeah, we got another two for here. Um, back when bands in the 70s could manage to put out two albums in one year. Uh, we got Four Wheel Drive and Head On by uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive. BTO. Huge hit making band out of Canada. Oh yeah, for, formed out of the remains of the Guess Who basically. Um, yeah, they, they, they were a total AOR radio band. Just. Yeah. Great they, had stuff. Their, they had the heavy rockers too. Yep. But, yeah. So they had four wheel drive. Let's see. Hits on there were Hey You. Na 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 na. Hey You. Yeah, that was the big hit off of it. Um, I don't see any other hits on this one. Not really. On this one, we got uh, my personal favorite cut by them is Take It Like a Man. That was a hit. Looking yep. Out for Number One was a big radio hit on this one. Uh, the rest of it, no. Really, just uh, this is kind of the end. I think this is towards one of their last of the classic albums. Yeah, it's a good album too. Again, both of them are good albums. I like them. This They're one's kind of straightforward hard rock. Yeah, this one's kind of cool. It folds out into a four. Show it. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's got the, all their faces on it. Yeah. It folds out into a big fold out poster. Uh, maybe not because I think I have to break a seal to do it, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's kind of you get you the go. idea. <laughs> Yeah, I'm all off here. You might have had one more. You may have had another copy of that. I don't remember, but I don't yeah, I think I gotta break the seal to make it the poster, and I'm not going to. Cool. Yep. Bob 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 Next up, kind of a. At some point, they kind of became a joke band. Um, if you ever watched that '70s show, it even was like a joke band in, this, in that '70s show. Remember, remember that? I don't know who we're talking about. Sticks. Oh, sticks. <laughs> Yep, Equinox. Oh, they, well, they became the butt of jokes, I guess. Yes, they, they sure did. They never really. Uh, it was more because of the sappy ballads that they started getting into, where that became. But this, this is one of the early on. They were still pretty prog, on here. Sweet, yeah, they were. Sweet Madam Blues on here, which is an awesome, awesome tune. Oops. And you don't have. Uh, let's see. So the band at this point is. Um, I don't Dave think Johnny's there yet. Nope. John Panoza. Chuck Panoza, Dennis D. Young. Oh, Dennis D. Young wasn't there. Oh yeah, Dennis yeah, is there. He's always yeah. there. Who am, I, who am I mixing up with? Uh, uh, Tommy Shaw. Tommy Shaw. And then, uh, but I don't think uh, the original John Kurluski, whatever his name, I don't think he was still in the band. Yeah, John Kurluski in the band. Still. Oh, he is still. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is right before uh, Crystal Ball, right. which is when Tommy Shaw entered the picture, and then they started having massive. Massive, yeah, because Tommy Shaw was a big rocker, and that's what he wanted to do. And right. then you, you had uh, was it which was it John Panoza, one of the guys, uh, Chuck Panoza, I can't remember which. Was John it and Chuck John? were the basin, basin. Uh, one of the guys, drummers, they were the it was like buddy heads because he all he wanted to do was ballads. And after they had, you know, the well, big, James James Young, James Young or J Y, to me, he was the real rocker in the band. Because any time, like uh, what was it? A couple albums later, Grand Illusion, Miss America, that was one of his tunes. He was always the ones that had the really killer riffs in it. He, to me, he was the rocker in the band. Yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is a good album, though. And I always love this cover. And Dennis Young was probably the one who wanted to do the sap. That's it. It is Dennis Young. And that's what he ended up doing. He just did a guest on another band's album, and this, the song they came up with is a total Sticks tune. And it's a bit, like, pre-Paradise Theater um, tick Sticks kind of sounding. I can't remember the name of the band, though, but it was pretty good. You got another one? Yeah, my turn? Yep. Oh, last one, maybe? No. Okay. Uh, the Who. The Who by Numbers. It was... Uh, this was close to the end. I mean, this maybe this is the second to last album that Keith Moon was on. Uh, big songs on here. Squeeze Box is on here. Big hit. My favorite, a little bit deeper cut, was Slip Kid. 
Yeah, that's, that one's been on the radio quite a bit too over time. Yeah. yeah, I love that track. That's one of my favorite Who songs. Just slipped in. It's one of those albums that has an annoying white cover that's always dirty. Yep. And one of those another annoying covers where people feel the need to write on. They them. feel the need to do the 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 uh, connect the dots. And this one always reminded me of uh, Draw the Line by Aerosmith because it's a similar, not the same artist, but just the same style. Same vibe, yeah, some of the same uncoated stock. Fact, and John Entwistle, the bass player, drew this. Yeah, that was him. So, Yeah, the Who by Numbers. Two more to go, and this is where all the runners up. And this is another two for one. Kansas, Mask, and uh, Song for America. There you go. Song for America, you see the classic Kansas logo enters the picture finally. And that's yeah, good prog rock, uh, yeah. American prog rock, AOR, yeah, them, them and Sticks, really, they yeah. were very similar. I used to mix them up a lot back yeah. in the day. Um, I don't know why, it's, but I just did. Big tracks on here. Song for America is probably the only one that you really would have seen appear on any of their best stuff. I don't think there was any sense. songs in this album that, was, no. that were a hit. They were still pretty proggy at that point. Yeah, and this, I like both these albums quite a bit. Like, good tunes on this one. Icarus, more on Wings of, Wings of Steel. The Pinnacle's pretty cool. Mysteries and Mayhem. This one's got uh, Hymn to the Atmans on it, Incomudro. It's, like I said, still definitely very much more proggy uh, than a hit machine that they would become. With Dust in the Wind and yeah, the Return. And the Return and all that. And uh, Left Overture. Mm -hmm. But still, Kansas, good stuff. Solid. Terry Livgren, great vocalist, yep. great guitarist. Yep. <clears throat> all right. Last one. Oh, Argent Circus. Argent Circus, yeah, there's really nothing on here you're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> this was, I think, uh, next to last album for them. It's still the, the, the main guys are still here. Rod Argent's still the centerpiece. Uh, where is he? Oh, missing from this, very, very noticeably, is Russ Ballard. He wasn't uh, in the band anymore at this point. He probably started his solo career already. And he was the songwriter. Man, yep. Russ Ballard is a songwriter. He was huge in the 80s. He wrote lots of songs in the 80s. Yep. For other and bands. a lot of people covered his stuff, stuff you wouldn't recognize. Like uh, Ace Frehley covered a couple of his tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all over the place. Places I don't even remember at the moment. So, but Argent, I always loved him. They grew out of the, the 60s band, The Zombies which Rod Argent was a part of also. Uh, great keyboard organist. But I, again, this isn't one of the ones that I'm going to reach for first if right, I'm either. checking out some Argent. And that's the reason that they're all on just a runners-up list. Yeah. So I think we're entering our top 25 or so. That's it. So you want to do this one. So we'll be right back with that one. All right. All right. So we're back. This is the um, numbers 20 through... Uh, um, yeah. No, this is numbers 11. No, this is 20 through 11. <laughs> or 25 or 26 through number 1. There you go. There we go. That's the. But this first part, two. yeah, we've got. What we have here is a pile that's going to be basically 25 through 9. All right, through 10. Right. There. Yeah. And all the way to 1 if we don't take another break. Yep. All right, so. This coming is all in number, you, buddy. Coming in number 25. Angel, the debut, 1975, Casablanca Records. The uh, anti kiss. Yep. Um, huge stage show, huge looks, and all white, not black, as opposed to kiss. And the proggiest we're ever going to hear Angel ever. Very proggy. Well, for the last, um, the first and last time. Very <laughs> keyboard driven, mm -hmm. as opposed to they would become way more guitar driven with, and Punky Meadows would become like the vocal point of the band. Yeah. As a point here where it was definitely more Greg Jafria who was the vocal point of the and band. And he, he was such a cool vocal point. I mean, almost like a like a Rick Wakeman kind of look and exactly. going on. And then you've got Frank Domino who's got this stellar, very unique, high-pitched, yep. clean vocal style. Definitely. Great album. I always love this cover art. Um, considered getting it tattooed on me one at one time, not just because of, of the band, but just because I always thought it was a cool graphic of an angel. It is, and it, <clears throat> that, that graphic kind of faded into the background once they get that cool, you can flip it over logo and it says the same thing upside down and right side up. Right. Which so many have tried to imitate, nobody has ever come close yeah, to having that neat of a logo. This, this is the logo here. They had to come up with that logo, logo which come, came about on the next album. But, yep. but the, the angel was always around. Even the next album, one of the, th yep. one of the things had like a horn on it. 
But uh, yeah, they, and it was always in the background behind them, you know. Yep. Back here, front door the stage thing. But, but I anyhow, think by the third album, it kind of they phased that out. Definitely was. But my favorite song in here, I mean, Tower is just a brilliant song, it's and it's awesome. a song that made me a fan of this band back yeah. in 1975 is when I first heard this and that song. So. And they've got the first version of Angel Theme, which closes out the album. Another, well, it's an instrumental. Which they, would, they would revisit it on the second album, but it was totally different. And then the other single from this album was Rock and Rollers, which is a more straightforward, heavy rock song, hard rock song, yep. whatever you call it. So. Number 25, yep. Angel. Or thereabouts. All right, what's next? Oh, yeah. Number 24. Give me the X rated one. In Trance by Scorpions. This is a great one. It's got, uh, it's, well, it's one of the Uli albums, so that it goes without saying that's going to be awesome. Uh, one of my favorite cuts on here of all time, Scorpion's tracks, is In Trance, the title track. In Trance is brilliant. It's one of my all-time favorite songs. <clears throat> we got Dark Lady, which is all Uli all the way. Uh, Robot Man, which is a very... I always like that tune. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorites. More of a metal metal trap. So yeah. it's top of the bill. So we've got... This is probably the... This is the beginning of the famously censored... Uh, in train, uh, Scorpions covers this one again. Is, I don't know if this is hypnosis. It's I don't think it is. I don't think it is. But this is the uh, U.S. cover, and you can't re unless you're it's really German. really paying attention. It's, it's got really, this. You can kind of see kind of Bridget Bardot looking German blonde, and she's straddled over a Stratocaster, and you know let your imagination do the rest. But if you see in the shadow, not too hidden, you get a little her breasts is, is, is sticking out. And on it's, this one, not so much. You can't see it, but it still looks like she just had her way with this guitar. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the uh, you know the Alice Cooper bit with the thumb where they just kind of blacked it out. Yeah, except that really was a breast. Yeah, <laughs> that was totally intentional. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and but you can barely see it. Oh, barely. It's it's in the shadows for sure, but it's definitely there. And Bam! Then, I love this album. I love anything you write off. Look how look how young you all are there too, man. It's crazy. Yeah, definitely. And Yuli's a nice guy, man. I love Yuli. And this has got the uh, the original drummer, what was his name? Uh, Rudy Lenners. He was also on the Virgin Killer album. I don't, was he on the first two as well? I don't remember. He, he disappeared, I think, after Virgin Killer, which was the next one. He kind of left the looking steam. <laughs> Scorpions. That, Scorpions was always a band that I loved way more than I realized. And like later on, I would, re I, I mean, I even got one of their song titles tattooed on my arm. <laughs> That's, it was, I didn't do it just because it was Scorpions, it's because what it meant. But still, I, I realized that Scorpions were a big part of my life and I wasn't really aware of it. Like I never called them a favorite band, but they were always like there. Some of their songs just, they meant a lot to me. Uh, and I love the Uli Roth, they are the best. Yep. So. Which is funny because uh, it's not really where I got into them. I got into them in the early '80s. Oh yeah. And they went backwards. But when I discovered, yeah, I them, think Blackout was the first one I ever heard. Yeah. I and I did the same thing. I went backwards. I think mine was what 1980 or 80. Yeah, it was 1980 because the songs like the Zoo were getting played on Z Rock. Oh, Animal Magnetism. Z Rock at the time or whatever it was called. And Animal Magnetism and uh, Love Drive were huge ones for me. I loved them. Metal Shop. W. I think it was either WYSP, WMR in Philadelphia. Anyhow, rambling. Next up. Hawkwind, War at the Edge of Time, Space Rock featuring, of course, Everybody Lemmy. Knows. This is the last album that Lemmy was on. Uh, we kind of goofed, and I think we did this one in '76, and we shouldn't have, because it's actually '75. But yeah, <clears throat> um, it's different than most of the stuff we're showing. Um, one of the songs that showed up from these sessions was the uh, the track Motorhead that Lemmy. It was a B-side to I think uh, Kings of Speed that was on here. And Lemmy ended up taking that, of course, the rest is history. That right. He created a whole band out of it. And uh, <clears throat> the album focuses on uh, Michael Moorcock's Elric saga again. And it's just really, it's, if you like those early Hawkwind albums, you'll like this one. It's just the same kind of thing. I just thought Lemmy really gave him a distinct sound. He did. Because that, that, he was a guitar player playing bass, basically. Yep. And he, and he was using that Rickenbacker. Yep, so you get that dirty sound that you get from the Rickenbacker. But you hear his voice in a lot of the back. I mean, he sang some, some lead in places too, right. but you can always hear his you voice. Him out. Yep. Along with Dave Brock, uh, you knew it was Lemmy. And he definitely did. And I I love most of all the Hawkwind I've ever heard, but the, like you write Heat, the early Hawkwind is it's, my favorite. I, yeah, it's iconic. It's it awesome. Is. It's great stuff. 
That was like number 23, somewhere, somewhere in that area. Like that. This is another twofer. Oh yeah. And this is a big... This, this band has actually been up in our number one, two slots several times. They have. Um, just not... Uh, I think it was Back in Black and Highway to Hell. Yep. Which would have been their massive albums. These were the beginnings. This was back in Australia. They were still on Albert Productions label. And TNT and High Voltage, this High Voltage is not the same as the one that came out in 76 in the U.S., which right. we always see, saw as their first. That was actually a compilation of these two albums. Exactly. And a lot of the tracks left off appeared later uh, on the 74 Jailbreak EP, yep. but not all of them. Nope. There were still a couple that they just never did really do anything with. But this is, this is the start right here. This is ACDC. They only had one thing prior to this, and it was a two-sided 12-inch, which had the original singer, uh, bass player Mark Evans' brother Dave, and they did uh, Can I Sit Next to You, Girl, and Rock It in the Parlor. That was the first official proper ACDC release, but this is where it started with Bond, and this is where history really was made. What you got here? Raw, nasty, rock and roll? I mean, everyone knows who ACDC is. Yeah. I don't have to really explain it. But if you don't, if you haven't heard these, I actually like these as much if not better than the U.S. release. Oh yeah, totally. I, they, they left off some great songs. They so. did. Th these are, uh, most notably they did a cover of School Days by Chuck, Chuck Berry. Berry. Which was a which huge influence. It seems to get left off of everything. I think the only place it ever really appeared was maybe that Backtracks box Oxid. set that I got back yeah. up here, but otherwise that's hard to find. And then uh, if I'm going to compare what they were kind of like back then, the only band that really comes to mind is like maybe Sweet, sorta. But even then, Sweet when they first started out, they had all this calypso kind of thing going on. That's definitely not here. It's like the, it's all the heaviness and the hard riffing of Sweet, without any of the the, the poppiness of the, the yeah. sweeter elements. And it's um, <laughs> and no no harm. I remember a lot of people confusing them to be a punk band back then too. ACDC? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were raw for sure. They were like this is down and dirty rock and roll the way it's supposed to be. But, yeah, I never considered him even slightly punk. No. Nah. Just really balls out, I mean, raw, rock and roll. In the 70s, we called them heavy metal. But we call them whatever we want to these days. But. Right. And they were really, they were kind of one of the bridges into all the, the heavy metal that became known as the standard in the 80s. ACDC, they could fit into it, but they could just as well not fit into it either. They there really was a lot were. of bands in the 80s that copied their sound. Oh, yeah, big time. Tons big of time. All right, next up. Nazareth, Hair yeah, Dog. We get the uh, great cover. American version here, UK version, same exact covers. The only difference being track three on uh, this one is Love Hurts, which is a massive hit. And on the UK one, it's a song called Guilty. Which yep. just it's not a massive hit. No. It's, just, <laughs> yeah. it's the same exact album except one song different. Uh, and it's a great one. I mean, if, if someone has never heard Nazareth and they need a place to start, this, this is the one. They yep. could start and end here, probably, if they wanted to. This album is so good, it might as well just be a Greatest Hits album. It's just great. It's all, all the way through. The back. All the way through. And in fact, it probably should have been higher on our list. <laughs> it really it could have been. Should have. We, I mean, it's, it's just hard when you get into so many great albums now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is it, this was they were weird too. Nazareth kind of had this thing where they'd get heavy and then they'd go light, and then heavy and then really it's, light. I put them in the same class as your ID. They yeah. have some great, great stuff, and then they get kind of spotty in places, and they kind of lose their style. It seems. But, but what they but what they excel at was man those freaking hits those uh, those vocals man that oh Dan, Dan McCafferty yeah he's awesome he's it, always spot on yeah he's just got that raw wrist yep. nobody sounds like him you know no. very unique uh, I put him and like Steven Tyler into a similar category only because they just only person I ever thought sounded like him close was Axl Rose yeah he's the bit. only one that I ever thought hey that sounds kind of like obviously his his higher bands not the low right. stuff he did but. But on here, again, the title track, Hair of the Dog, you, some of you know it as Now You're Messing with the Son of a Bitch. Yeah. Which it took me a while to figure out it was the same band. Ted, ignore me. Who is it? Maybe it's Dan McCaffrey. It's Lori. Yeah, take I'll, a break. Go ahead. Call it back. Finish it. Okay. Uh, Hair of the Dog. Yes, awesome. Miss Misery. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da. Da -da Great riffs all the way through. Love Hurts, massive hit. A cover, if I remember right. I don't remember if it's it was an, I think it's an older 50s, 60s type cover. Uh, Change in Times, another hard rocker. Uh, Beggar's Day. Rose and Heather is like the in instrumental outro of Beggar's Day. 
whiskey drinking woman, straight up rocker, and then my personal favorite, Please Don't Judas Me. That's a great song. Awesome. This is the great album, and it's a awesome cover. Yep. And it was, is this, I think this is Jim Fitzpatrick, if I remember correctly, the guy who did all the Thin Lizzy covers. No, it's not. It's Dave Rowe. Sorry. Very similar style to Jim Fitzpatrick, though. Yeah. It's very, it's just, I always love this cover. Oh, it's great. So. Cool. And it's kind of like the three-headed, it almost looks like a three-headed dog, you know, like Cerberus that guards oh, against no. the Hades and all that stuff. Next up. Another Scott twofer. Is, Lots of twofers. Scott too. is the keeper of the albums. Yes, we're doing a twofer here, too. Again, bands in the 70s somehow managed to do two albums a year. Rush was no exception. Uh, sometimes the out. well, I mean, you know, differing quality, but... These two are great albums. <laughs> Both of them, awesome. Yeah, this is this is basically the beginning of the Neil Peart era. Uh, Fly by Night was the first album he was on. Big hits on this one. Well, the title track, Fly by Night, gets regular airplay. Still on yep. classic rock radio. Uh, By Torn the Snow Dog is my favorite deep cut. Oh, that's awesome! I, I love the live version yep. with that growling bass sound. Rivendell's a great song. In the end, which closes it out, another great Rush song. Strong start for uh, basically a band that had to reinvent themselves after their main uh, songwriter and lyricist, uh, John Rutsey, the original drummer, left. And then they come back with this, and it's just like, wow. And I mean, Neil Peart filled the shoes and then some, even more so. I mean, the guy brought their lyrical quality and everything. Just, he brought Alex and Getty up several notches from the first album. Yeah, Great stuff. This was the second album, and heavy. Way heavier than the first album. Yeah, I think it's even heavier than oh, it totally is. Than uh, Fly By Night, um, kind of like uh, uh, almost a heavy Zeppelin vibe to it. And it's and they'll tell you that that they were just so it's almost like their heads were so big at this point they just made the most complicated, uh, un, non understandable album they could make. <laughs> like I don't know if they were trying to follow in the tracks a yes. And some of the stuff they were doing, I know yeah, they were definitely fans. progressive. Yeah. And, uh, for me, this album is one of those ones. It's not why I pick particular songs out and say, "Oh, I love that song. I love that song." It's one of those albums I like to hear from front to back. Yeah, and it's got two mega long prog numbers in it, um, which Best, is I know it starts with Bastille Day. Uh, the two, the oh crap, the way they have them listed. It's all the lyrics. It's not listed the way I need to see it. Okay, we got two big proggy numbers, which are you know like ten minutes plus. The Necromancer, and then on the B side we've got one that's well, of course, the Fountain of Lameth, which has kind of become a joke in recent years. Um, but again, it's it's the beginning of that. Hey, we're going to do a whole side that's one song, and we get with uh, with with broken up titles such as Didax and Narpets, uh, Bacchus and Bacchus Plateau. <laughs> I mean, it's it's heady stuff for sure, and who knows what the hell they're talking about and. Probably, chances are they didn't even know what they were probably not out. <laughs> but yeah, again, I think coupled with getting these high, very high, oh, like yeah. like sucking in helium high uh, vocals mixed with that heavy, uh, not only guitar tone, but it was a really heavy growly bass tone. Yeah, I, I love the Rickenbacker bass tone. And with and, with you know, for its uh, bizarro time changes in places. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, all right, if you're just a casual Rush fan, you're probably going to dig Bastille Day. It's got a killer riff in it. Yeah. Awesome riff. And if you're just a casual Rush fan, you probably ignore this record yeah. and go right to all the hits. But yeah, and Lakeside Park is a great uh, kind of a mellow track. And there's a track on here that like you would even hear maybe on Dr. Demento, I Think I'm Going Bald, which, you know, that kind of showcases that they actually have a sense of humor. Yeah. You know, which is cool. You don't see a lot of bands do that anymore, that they throw in a song that's... It's in their style, but it's funny. Yeah. So, Rush, I mean, yeah. Can't say enough good things about Rush, really. Oh boy, this was an interesting one. I mean, I think people are going to be shocked to see it so high in our list. It's being, a great a, album. being now the top twenty. For Squire, Fish Out of Water. Water. It's, uh, it, it is one of my favorite solo it's, albums from one of the Yes guys. It's probably my absolute favorite one. Uh, John Anderson's solo stuff was a little harder for me to get into. Yeah, it's okay. But uh, this Steve, one, I loved it right from Steve the Howe had some good solo stuff. Yeah. But this, but this one, one is, this one grabbed me, and I just loved it. It's pretty much a Yes album without John Anderson's backing back vocals with it, because yeah. you can really hear how much Chris Squire's voice contributed to the, to yes the sound, sound of Yes, absolutely, here. big time. And then you can also hear how much 
he was the heaviness of yes. Yes. Because he was that he was the rhythm section that. Yep. That heavy again, Rickenbacker. That it's, dirty, nasty Rickenbacker. And sound. it's unmistakable the way he would play it. Yep. Uh, the other thing you really hear on here, as well as in some. Uh, yes, material is he loved the Beach Boys, and a lot of the harmonies that he put together, it, it's reminiscent of Beach Boys stuff on Pet Sounds. So I was like, well, that was unexpected to me when I first started hearing it. But uh, it's not, it's not hard to believe that the Beach Boys were, they were like a seminal band. They influenced a lot of people. It's just you don't really hear too much about it. Right. Not the way that you hear the Beatles influence people, but the Beach Boys were right up there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessarily just talking about all the surfing stuff that they did. It was when they started getting from Pet Sounds, and Brian Wilson started to get getting kind of progressive and experimental. I think that's when they had their biggest influence on people. Yep. This is a great album. It's not a song on that I don't like. Were there any hits on it? Not really. No, nope, I don't think it was any. No. But it's a great listen. It might have had a hit on it if it would have been a Yes album. Yeah, it's a great listen, uh, beginning to end, and I'll even just let it spin all day long. That's how much I like listening to it. It's just a really enjoyable record. Yep, agreed. Hi, right, this next one, beginning of a new band.